welcome to the Kitten Club. For those who don't know anything about the Kitten well, first of all, I'm James. I'm producer of West Words. I'm also a writer in my own right. Um, Patricia, who's a teacher librarian, you've, you may or may not have heard my name in the traps over the years, but it's sort of dropped off the radar a little bit in the last few years. But uh, well, that's how things go. Um, we'll get back on the bike eventually, I guess. Uh, uh, and uh, Westward sort of takes in basically everything, everything west of Parramatta, east of Lithgow and Hawkesbury, Campbelltown. I'm currently sitting in my in the office at, um, I'll just open this up and you'll see where I am. Uh, I'm currently in the Westward's office right there, um, but that's much more interesting. Uh, <laughs> We're down in Wedderburn at the moment, which is down south of Campbelltown. Um, and yes, that is a long way from uh, the Blue Mountains. And that is a hell of a drive. But uh, so we're on Darawal country here. Um, what? So uh, you're on Darragh country, uh, Jasmine and Leanne. What country, country would you be on? Darragh too. Yeah. Darragh as well. Uh, Borkham Hills, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, just before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, people from all Indigenous country and their um, and ancestors and uh, elders past, present and emerging and um, I think everybody understands that um, we're in the middle of a, we were just having this discussion before we started the video officially uh, in this interesting place in Australia where suddenly um, all the stuff that we were taught as young people in school, the um, very settler centric and, and um, Anglo-centric is, is starting to crumble away a little bit, and I think that's a good thing. So um, uh, I'd just like to make that acknowledgement. Um, so we've got two guests here. We've got uh, Jasmine Seymour, who's going to wave. Hello, Jasmine. Um, uh, who, you're a, well, we'll get to what you do, Jasmine. And uh, Leanne Mulgo-Watson, who is there. Yeah, and, uh, and our other other guest, Patricia, who is a teacher librarian at, uh, at St. Michael's in Borkham Hills, uh, presumably a Catholic school, is it? It is. It's a large primary um, school. We have 750 to 770 in that vicinity, I think, students right now. Hmm. So um, we are hoping there's going to be more people. We did send the invitation out to a lot of people and we have at times had big numbers, but unfortunately not tonight so far. But it is the first event of the year. We did notice that um, things started to drop off quite dramatically towards the back end of last year as Zoom fatigue, which is not a term. <laughs> exactly. We would never have used the term previously, but um, Zoom fatigue has been setting in. So um, here we are. Uh, I'm just going to get that on. That's, that works better. Okay, so um, for those of you wondering, uh, and I do this little spiel every time because some people get a little bit kind of confused at the name, um, Hemingway's polydactyl kitten club and speakeasy. And anyone reading the actual email today will have noticed that I call them polydactyl canines. As I typed that, I thought, there's something not right about this, but I was too, I just did it anyway. And then Michael, my boss went, James, what's a cat? And I said, a feline. He said, well, why do you say canine? I said, oh, damn it. So, um, <laughs> best, which I failed. Um, but the story is that Ernest Hemingway uh, had a bit of a penchant for, um, polydactyl cats, cats with extra toes. Whoa. Yeah, I know, trippy, hey? So if you go to, um, if you were to go to Hemingway's house in Florida, Florida Keys, you would find all these kittens everywhere um, with extra toes and they're all direct descendants of Hemingway's cats. So, so we thought we would just, I don't know why we, why we called it that, we just thought that was, that was cool. Um, and it's a spoken word thing and usually just people who do kind of open mic and read some work. Um, I'm not going to do that tonight because unless Patricia came prepared, I certainly did not. Um, so <laughs> we'll just uh, we'll just crack on. So let's introduce our guests. Um, Jasmine, let's start with you. Uh, you're a teacher um, at Riverston Public School. Um, yes. You're also an illustrator and a writer. Um, can you tell us a little bit about more about yourself and? Um, and uh, then we'll yeah. as well. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. I, my name is Jasmine Seymour. I'm a Durrug woman. I am a descendant of Maria Locke and Yarramundi. My family have always lived out on the Hawkesbury. 
Um, they still live out there on the Hawkesbury along um, around near South Creek, um, Moralia sort of area. Um, I, in my earlier life, I was a musician and a jazz singer. Um, and then I had some children and I decided I would go back to school and become a primary school teacher. And as I was doing that, I was, as I was entering school, you know, um, sort of talking to Leanne about how there were no direct language books available for anyone out in the Hawkesbury. And so, um, when we were sort of discussing that, um, Leanne was talking about, uh, Leanne had all these incredible pictures that she was doing for a seasonal calendar. And we really, um, we just thought we would have a go and, and see what happened. And um, we, that's how Kui Mitiga sort of started because we were really desperate for there to be something for the kids out in the Hawkesbury. And there was just nothing, nothing at all. Um, and so we, we sort of started doing that. I think that probably took about six months or even a year, didn't it, Leanne, maybe to get it all together. And then I just sent it to every single person I could think of. And um, we got a couple of people that were interested and then it really slowed down again. And it went quiet and I, I started hustling um, some of the people that were really interested. And um, then um, Magabala became interested. And I also done a picture of a woman holding a, a baby um, over a, um, a fire, like a baby smoking ceremony. And those people had seen that picture and said, thought that it would make a really good um, picture book and asked me to have a go at that and so I was at the time we were working on um, the secret river the real secret river project with Grace Carstens and we were out on country a lot and doing a lot of art and um, I was thinking about what a contemporary baby smoking ceremony would look like on country and what that would mean for us and that's sort of the idea with how that happened and um, Eventually, Baby Business got published um, a couple of months before Kui Mitiga, as Kui Mitiga sort of went through more edits and reviews um, to get that to where it is today. Yeah, so that's the sort of the story of how these two books um, came about. Well, um, what beautiful book. Thank you. It is a beautiful book. Um, so, uh, and we have Leanne. So, Leanne, you're also from, from the Hawkesbury originally, is that correct? Yeah, hello. I'm a Darug woman as well from the Hawkesbury. I ha do have connections to other places, but um, the Hawkesbury is my home. Um, I have been brought up um, with culture all my life, um, and I've been really lucky that my mum and my brother and my aunties were artists. So... I sort of just used to do a bit of painting with them and absolutely love it. And I like to use do, doing artwork for education to show people how amazing our culture is. Um, I'm always doing artwork. I can't help myself. Well, I'm okay. Oh, no. <laughs> um, for those watching later um, or now, uh we did a we did commission jasmine to do a couple of these a couple of pictures for our um oh that's gonna be hard to see hang on sorry well hang on oh there we go um a couple of pictures which ended up on the front cover of a book from bidwell public so that was the front cover picture and this is and they lifted elements from that one oh sorry <laughs> 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 But this, this blue one is killer. So um, we do do a, mm. we're about to do our second. And I love when, um, wow. when, uh, when Leanne came out to the, um, came out to the presentation or the launch of the book, um, I, I said to her, um, oh, I love how you've done those really sort of, that really fine sparkly um, 
kind of stars. How did you do that? And what was your answer, Leanne? Uh, with a toothbrush. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just flattered it all, all across there. That was kind of a, a very um, weird, like they, to me, the illustrations that I did took me a while to work out with the list of things that were like on it. Yeah, we I got was procrastinating. There's a, a whole bunch of um, poems from, from Bidwell Public and, and uh, the brief basically was we've got all these poems and stories by, about different things. This is what some of them are about. Can you try and include some of those in some sort of drawing and, and, and <laughs> to start ticking them off one by one. Um, so uh, just to let you know that uh, we do a, an annual art auction to raise, raise um, funds for Westwards and Leanne's two pictures are going to be first cabs off the rank. So thank you so much for that, Leanne. I appreciate you sending those. Through. Um, no worries. Yeah, so um, I've got to say that when I, the, my first exposure to the books, the book by either of you was, was Kui Mitigar. Um, and it sort of struck me that it said it was a story on Darig song lines. But the thing that I noticed when I started digging into it a little bit, because I, I was... I was um, honoured to be one of the judges for the Prime Ministers this year, and, and this book, of course, won the Prime Minister's Award. Um, one of the things that I, I really kind of noticed very early on is the fact, even though it says it's a story on Darragh's song lines, it felt to me like it, um, it started soaring, if that's the right word, over Darragh country, but then it just sort of kept going, and it felt like it carried, carried the reader across much wider country than that, that Darragh. Was that an intentional... Um, intentional thing on the part of, of you ladies? Um, I think, I think, you know, well, the, well, the song line, it doesn't really start and end in one section of, um, of country. So it's, it's part of a much wider and bigger story always. Isn't that right, Leanne? Yeah, it is. So for us, what what thing for us? A song line? Yeah, right. how would you define that? Sorry. Yeah. Bit of a lag. So for us, as songlines, um, this you know, the pathway of my ancestors as uh, as they created country. So it's the story of them and it tells us everything we need to know about when it is um, right to hunt and um, what to hunt and it tells us where our ceremonial sites are and the times to do them. And it is, it is the path, their, their path across country that informs our life. Did you want to add anything, Leanne, at all? Yeah, as we travel across our path, pathways, we do sing to country. Um, we sing to country to let country know that we're, where we are and that we're passing through. When we sing to country to let our neighbours know that we're coming in to their country. Um, Big part of our culture, um, the song lines, and they're song lines because of that. Because we sing countries, like we sing, sing the mountains, and it's um, got a lot to do with the spiritual part of our culture as well. So it's um, really important that we, the song lines, do travel right over Australia. They don't just stop in Darry Country; they continue. So I'm pretty happy that that came out in the book. Mm -hmm. To be honest. Um, so what I'm, yeah, very much so. so what, what I might do, if, if it's not self-indulgent, just read this, um, the report from the uh, Prime Minister's Award because I, I, was, I felt very honoured to be asked to, to write this one. So I, I, I kind of... I think it says everything I need to say about this book and then we can talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Whilst it is not in any way new for culture and languages to be introduced to young readers through picture books, Kui Mitagar approaches this objective in a style that is at once moving, informative, immersive, welcoming, and potentially healing. After traversing the organic and tactile design and muted colours of the cover, the cover, I have to say, is exquisite. Oh, my God. I don't know where Donna is. Donna was going to be here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, the reader is led into a textually and visually rich world, which, despite being in English and Darug, is, in fact, a love song to the natural beauty of wider Australia and the proud traditions of its original inhabitants. Unlike most other books featuring words from languages other than English, each page of text in this book includes its own mini glossary, which offers the reader a more seamless experience of understanding the meaning in the text. 
This means that a very real sense of rhythm is achieved, which is in keeping with the full title, Kui Midigar, A Song on Direct Songlines. However, it is in the sharing of this book with a very young reader that the textual magic really happens. Within the space of a few pages, the child is taking in and understanding lines of text which include Darig words I only heard moments earlier. They are quite literally learning language as they read. Little sidebar, my, my grandson, who was four when I was reading this book, um, I test drove a lot of the picture books on him. And um, this was, uh, it, it was really remarkable how we'd get to the end and we'd, by the time we got to the end when you were repeating certain words, you'd go, oh, that means so-and-so. And he was remembering just in the space of uh, half a book. I mean, so he was learn literally learning, learning language. But of course, Kui Midigar is about far more than learning words of a language. It is a work of art that is beautiful and accessible and with wonder on each new page for children and adults alike. In keeping with the promise contained in the full title, it lifts us on the rhythms of days and seasons and carries us on a journey across Darug country and far beyond in a respectful, reverent pay into a land which two centuries ago boasted hundreds of distinct languages and dialects, most of which have since become extinct. In addition to the wonderful depictions of flora and fauna, the skies are constant throughout this book subtly reminding the reader of the enormity of what we still have and its beauty that we can ill afford to spurn. It is noteworthy that the human inhabitants of the country are not explicitly depicted. They are simply woven into the text as custodians of and partners with the natural world. They are in keeping with the invocation to tread softly in our lands on the final page, part of the land without claiming dominion over it. Uh, Kui Mitigar is a book that the author and illustrator publisher, Indigenous people in general, and in fact, all Australians should feel proud to acknowledge and share. As any teacher or communicator will readily explain, didacticism alienates one audience, one's audience, but story and beauty draw the audience closer and facilitate understanding and acceptance. Any book, book which can reach our youngest minds with such gentleness and generosity of spirit should be applauded by all Australians. Um, so that, that was what came to the judging panel as we read it. Um, how much of that is a surprise to you guys, or was that all packed in there? Yeah, you can be honest now, you can tell us. Did, did you specifically think about all of these things as you're doing it? Was, 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 because to me, um, as I say, the sky really was a presence in this book. Was the sky mm. you played with? Well, I think um, while, while you're saying that, I was thinking about why there were no people in that book. And the thing is, for me, when, when I was thinking about that, or what I think about that now, is that, you know, um, Aboriginal people with their totems, with country, we are all the same thing. So um, country and, um, the, you know, the animals and the sky, they represent us in our physical form. And that's not something that ever goes away. You know, once you step into country, you really feel that sense of belonging and you you really get a sense of that it's all very much there and alive and around you um and i think th that bigness is something that we did want in the book very much because that is really big that sense of um belonging through um you know deep time and space yeah. that's what i think about that and of course, this is the, just for anyone looking along, and I think Grace has just joined us. Um, let me just get this up for you. I, oh, sorry, I went to the middle of a share screen in the middle of a thing, and here we go. That's not the one we asked for, the share. That's not it, is it? Hang on. Sorry, folks. Uh, all right, so. <coughs> Now, I was really hoping. That's not sharing the right page, is it? No. Ah, sorry, folks. Have you got a copy there you can hold up? Yep. Good. <laughs> I think too, you know, that, that idea that it's 60,000 years or more, you know, this is the sort of time we're talking about mm. in this, the, this book. And, um, you know, a lot of our ancestor creation spirits are shaped shifters and they shift into um, these beings. And um, so that was very much on my mind. 
when we were creating this. And also that um, this doesn't exist separately to us. It's happening still now yeah. too. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you, ask each of you, before we kind of officially started the video, we, um, or the recording, we, we were talking about, I guess the, the moment we're in at the moment in terms of, um, you know, we're talking about changing what we, the way we, the, your, your reason for writing this book in a sense was to alert Indigenous kids, but also non-Indigenous kids to the, the, the culture and the pride and the language and, and so forth. Um, it sort of feels to me like we're in a bit of a moment where every year the, the whole um, renaming Australia Day thing becomes more of a conversation and, and we're, we're seeing you know, the Black Lives Matter thing in America has drifted to, to us and we've got football teams that are you know, refusing to sing the words of the national anthem until they're changed and those sorts of things. And we did note in the Prime Minister's Awards that there were, there were a, a, an enormous number of um, First Nations books that didn't make the cut and many that did as well. Um, what do, you, what do you think of that idea that we're in a moment where, where there's, there's more, more accessibility and more acceptance of, of these stories, Jasmine and Leanne? I didn't really expect Kui Mitiga to win, um, in all honesty, because of how my mum and Nan weren't allowed to speak language in this country. So for to win the award was really special to me because um, they'd been silenced. And um, that was the process of trying to stop that our language being spoken in country and disconnect us from our culture in like one of the best ways, I guess, to do it. So for us to win an award that was national nationally accepted, a Darug language book to me was really amazing. Are you, are your nan and mum still with us? Um, my nan is, mum is, she's um, very elderly now. She's in her mid eighties. Um, and it just felt like we'd come full circle because they were told that they couldn't speak language because if their children spoke language, they'd be taken. So my grandmother spoke Darug fluently, but when the kids went anywhere near, they shushed because they didn't want the kids to learn. Um, but mum actually grew up, she was quite an activist. A lot of Aboriginal people had a lot of fear around culture, but mum sort of went into schools and taught culture and, and really continued with the language. So I was really lucky in that way, to be honest. Yeah. But yeah, it was really special in that way. It was like having my mum traded the way she was for like, like for sharing language and culture. And then we actually write a dairy language book and it wins an award like that is just amazing. Mm. And the acceptance that it's had is amazing too. Like lots of people absolutely love our book, which is amazing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, no, this is a beautiful book. Good. It's not amazing, really. It's a beautiful book, and you know, I'm listening to you. And where I work, we have very few Indigenous students, three, I think. But it's there's a thirst from all of us, and from um, not just the the children, but the teaching staff to want to know more, yeah. and to want to know it in a way so we're being respectful. Um. And that's not always easy, you know, um, because well, I grew up in a completely different time. And if you think history is bad now, it was woeful when I was at school. We really knew nothing about it. And I grew up in Western Queensland. And I think you know, there were some atrocities that were that happened right near us. And I remember my father being, you know, there was a, a big thing in for our family because he spoke out about it all the time, but I never really knew. And really, it's only in recent years that we've ever talked about any of the the conflict between the settlers and the Indigenous people. So, you know, we're hungry for these books. We really are hungry for them. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. My, for my family, when um, my uncle, you know, he's... Um, He's a Darug man who's always lived in the Hawkesbury and he was taught from very young not to say anything about it. 
And when I first showed him the books, um, he, uh, he didn't really say very much at first, but when he opened Kui Midiga up, he started saying the words and you could see him playing with them. And then he, you know, he sort of said, wow, this is my language. And you could see how that delighted him. And then when uh, we won the award, I, I went back out and I saw him, he's 94. And he said to me, oh, be careful, be really careful. Because he's still worried about the payback for saying you're Aboriginal or um, being Aboriginal. <laughs> so I just thought that was, you know, he's, he's still terrified to this day about that. Um, and that's the legacy of being Aboriginal in the Hawkesbury for sure. Um, you weren't allowed to speak about it at all. Even you certainly weren't allowed to be proud of it. Even, even though every and time you drive to Springwood, you drive past a place with a family name for you. Yep. It is a family name for you, isn't it? That's right. Yep. Nope. It's a closed mouth, a shut door. It's something, you, certainly in the Hawkesbury, it, is, it has been a big silence. And they say about the Darug people, that we were the first colonised and that we're the last recognised. And um, part of that is, you know, is the colonisation story. We have been the most affected. And um, we are the place now where lots of Indigenous people live. And uh, we don't look like anyone else either. You know, we are often more fairer skinned. Yeah. And so the story of Aboriginal Australia isn't what most people think it is as well. We don't always look like we just stepped out of a mission or we come from the central desert. The story is very diverse. Yeah. And um, so you need all voices, not just some. Uh, I, I mean, we could continue to talk about this for for a long time, but I actually want to, I don't want to just define this book in terms of its Aboriginality. I don't, I don't think that's a fair approach because that's certainly when it won a big award, it wasn't judged simply on that basis. It was judged as a work of literature. Um, so I, I, from a writing perspective and a, and a literature perspective, I'd be really keen to hear each of you talk about your approach to the, the collaborative, collaborative process and the writing process. I mean, Jasmine, you're, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, but Jasmine um, was also recently named um, Best Emerging Illustrator in the Children's Book Council Award. So congratulations on that as well for, uh, for baby business. And I've got to say, baby business, I, I felt a little uneasy reading it because I, I did feel like I'd sort of stumbled onto, um, stumbled into lands where I wasn't supposed to be. It, it, it certainly has that kind of feel to it. Um, but I'd be really keen to hear you each talk about your approach to the process either of telling a story through pictures or telling a story through words and the collaborative process. I don't know who wants to start. Do you want to go, Lee? Yeah, I, I tend to tell stories through artwork because I am an artist. So I, a lot of the stories that I do, I do without words. I do notice that when I do talk to other people and we're looking at different artworks and things like that, I'm always looking at the pictures, not the writing. And I had a friend point that out to me a long time ago that we just see things completely different. So I kind of, I don't know, I just have such a connection to everything. I can't sort of look at things that aren't just based on Aboriginality because that's just who I am. Um, I don't know if you noticed when you did your recent trip to the, um, to the state, state, you went to the gal art gallery of New South Wales, is that where you went? Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. The first thing that struck me when I first went there years ago, and I might have talked about this before on one of these, is um, the very early English settlers, the paintings that they did of um, trees, for example, they look nothing like Australian trees actually look, they're just sort of, they can't shift their, their way of looking outside of willows and, and, and beech and birch and so forth. And so all these angophoras that are really gnarled and crooked and bent and, and wizened, they're all willowy and graceful. And then as the time goes on, they start to kind of see it. Is that, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Seeing, seeing things through a particular filter and, and finding it hard to shift out of that? Yeah, I do actually. I look at trees sometimes as people and all sorts of different strange things like that, I guess. Um, 
yeah so um i don't know i do i do write stories but i really do focus on the picture side of things um and i've been telling stories i guess for a long time in my life now i've always actually wanted to do books so i'm really happy that we did do Kui Mitiga and I'm hoping we do do lots more um, because I've absolutely loved it. Do you feel a certain pressure as a as an illustrator who's who who values a language that is um, that doesn't have as many speakers as it as it should? Do you feel a certain pressure to stay in the spoken word and and use language rather than go to illustration? Yeah, I do actually, and I've just enrolled to do language and linguistics in uni this year. So yes, very much get moving into the language side of things. When we've been we've been working on language projects now for a little while, and the Derek language is just so beautiful that I really want to start getting more into the words. Um, it's kind of it's just an absolutely beautiful language. So it's funny you say that because um, when the uh it was a, I think a football game, somebody did an introduction in, in Darug and a whole bunch of my friends independently in conversations went, I don't know what he was saying, but gosh, that was beautiful. There, there is something really kind of um, lyrical about the language, isn't there? Yeah, some beautiful words, yeah. definitely. So we just want to um, get our language so that the language, so that we can share the language with everybody and get coming back just being commonly spoken within our communities and not only Aboriginal communities but everybody mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of programs now going through the schools that um, the Darug language is being spoken I did a floor mural at a school not long ago and all the kids were walking past speaking Darug to me so it would just blew me away so it's really um it's fantastic do you ever do you ever sneak do either of you ever sneak a kind of slightly envious glance towards New Zealand because they they kind of long time ago made the point of including Māori in 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 all their sort of um yeah it's everywhere yeah in, in their ceremonial language and in their welcome language and so forth is that, is that presumably that's something you'd like to see eventually introduced yeah, yeah. I actually did Māori classes with my husband many years ago because he was learning the Māori language and um, thought I'd do it with him and help him out a little bit, but I was I had the wrong accent for it. <laughs> but I can understand the language when it's spoken. I just can't speak very well in Māori. But when you get when you get out of their airport, it's it's just right there. It's everywhere, so it's yeah. a good thing. But they also have treaty, don't they? So. Yeah. I mean, uh, and as flawed as it may be, that certainly helped that process along, mm. you know. And we still don't have treaty. They have um, total immersion in their preschools, so they don't yeah. speak English in the preschools. It's all Māori. Mm. When Malcolm Turnbull was given the opportunity to actually acknowledge this, there was a big fat no, wasn't it? So that yeah, that's right. I'm just going to let um. Um, so, uh, Jasmine, what about you, your approach to the, the writing of this book and the collaborative process? Because you're, you're, actually, you're actually doing your PhD at the moment in, remind me? No, I did a master's last year in Indigenous um, Languages Education. So, yeah, at my school I'm teaching a full Darug um, language program integrated with geography this year. So mm. that's been really, really exciting. Um, and I feel, you know, so because Darug was one of the first languages that was used in Australia for white people, many of our words are common words in the English language, you know, and, and that was part of the joy of Kui Mitiga because that word Kui or Gawi for us, that's our word, you know, um, wombat, wallaby, all these really iconic Australian words are Darug words that have just slipped into uh, the lexicon, you know, and that's the case for lots of um, Aboriginal languages around. And I even think that long mate sound comes from Aboriginal languages, you know, that's our sound, that's how we sound. 
Um, and I think that is so beautiful that you hear that in the way Australian accents are. And I do think, you know, um, Australian languages, because that's what they call Aboriginal languages, they are Australian languages. We would have, um, we've been told a lie that they're very difficult and they're not. Once you know the rules, you're in and you know how to understand them and it's actually very easy. And I think that's one of the longest lingering violences against Aboriginal people that we don't get taught how our language works from when we're very young because it causes enormous problems for us in our communities. And, um, you know, it's something that would benefit all of us, all Australians to understand that. And so for me, thinking about writing going forward, you know, you want to advocate for language constantly and you want to see it become normal because it should be normal. We should be multilingual. Um, I'm excited about the future and particularly about writing because it really does, you know, I think this is a moment with everything that is happening that it's going to get um, more accessible for more Australians. Yeah. And I guess we're fortunate that we live in an age when um, we've been having this conversation with, with some of our, um, some of our, our African uh, partners with Westwards and, talking about um, people whose stories are, are oral, oral recorded stories or oral uh, stories. And we now have the technology to, to keep these, ar these stories archived. And I, I suppose that's one thing to be positive about it. We now have the technology to really quite simply archive language as it's discovered and, and unearthed and, and rediscovered and so forth. Um, and, uh, sorry, oh, yeah, I think Oh, I was just going to say, I think one of the real beauties about Australian languages is that it is almost an onomatopoeic um, language. So the word, our words sound like the mm. things they describe. And that is what is really beautiful about it. So, um, and that's really remarkable. It's gorgeous. It has this really uh, beautiful link to nature. It's, it's incredible. But when you, when you learn your language, um, you know, you have access to your culture and community and stories. It is really, really incredible stuff. Um, so, uh, can you settle a bet for me? Actually, no, it's not settling a bet, it's just um, something that... Uh, unpin, unpin. Sorry, folks. I've just forgotten how to zoom. Um, oh, come on. Remove all pins. There we go. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Um, now, it may have been Eora uh, or, or Darren, I'm not sure, but the, the story I heard was that the word Waratah was the local word for beautiful. And so when the settlers were asking Indigenous people, what do you call this? And they said, Waratah, which means beautiful, and they went, oh, cool, it must be called a Waratah. In actual fact, they, were, they thought it was a noun, and in actual fact, it was an, an adjective. Is that, does that story make any sense? Does that story ring true in any way? Have you ever heard this before, or am I just talking out my butt? Lee, have you heard that before? I've heard Waratah does mean beautiful. Right. Um, it is a Darig word. Waratah is the Darig word. Um, Eora is actually a the Darig language as well. Right. Eora is a Darig word for Nura, which is place. Um, the Eora um, nation is a contemporary nation. Right. They're not the traditional owners of the place. So it's all Darig language across Sydney. Um, See, I, I had a suspicion as I launched into that question, I thought <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've screwed up the Eora thing here and I'm going to get corrected. So, so I'm, I'm happy <laughs> I think for us, you know, that, that like your little story about Waratah is so, um, you know, that is so common in language. So when they asked some Aboriginal people what that place was, those people looked out and said, Yura. And that's the name for a people. And they were really pointing at some people. <laughs> they weren't context of that is wrong you know so um so that happens a lot with language so it may be that that was the case with waratah we, 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 we mean, don't really know i'm going to cling to that as it a, is a good I think that sounds, that sounds <laughs> yes. 
and, and our truth is in the, the yeah. Um, did anyone, any of our, um, our other attendees, Grace, is, I know Grace, but Grace has gone sort of gone to ground, so we can't see her. Um, Kennedy's here. Hi, Kennedy and Patricia. Any, uh, sorry for being late, man. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. Um, welcome back. Uh, Thank you. Did anyone have any questions at all for, for Jasmine or Leanne? Well, I've just I've just got one in terms of um, the uh, direct language and the work of uh, what was his name William Dawes in his notebook. Is that you know, how do you feel about that? Is that authentic, Jasmine and Leanne? Very much so. They even say you know Dawes's work is probably some of the the closest to the actual sounds we will ever get because it was completely um, untouched by any other sound. So we're extremely lucky to have that resource. Oh, yeah. good, because I've used that with the kids. It's just the, uh, to me and that, that whole story of him, well, the little bit that I know seemed something that was really precious at that time. Mm. It's oh, good. Ordinary. Mm. Mm. And, you know, the sad thing about that, once you read those notebooks, um, once you get past reading about some of that stuff, all the stuff about guns start to appear. And, um, and that's really quite shocking. And you can see the effects of colonisation happening immediately and just that language exchange that is happening. And I think that's really extraordinary too because in lots of other languages it's all... Um, religious sort of speak because it's missionaries talking to mm. Aboriginal people and it's a lot of talk about um, God. And so for Dawes, for his conversations to actually be about guns and the things that are happening is really extraordinary. And I think that was the reason why he, he was sent home, wasn't it? It was over, yes, I can't quite remember it all, but no, well, that's, that's good to know because that's part of, I think, the challenge for us when we don't necessarily know the full story and what's really respectful. Mm. But that's good to know that about those notebooks. What's next for... Um... I... Sorry, go on. Sorry, no, go. Yeah. Carry on, please. Oh, well, I was just going to say that the, I know that um, baby business isn't possibly the focus for tonight, but I just think that's an extraordinary book um, and I've given it to my little grandson. And um, But then from our point of view at work, you know, I'm, I'm working in a Catholic school um, and some of, some of the traditions and everything there, the, there's nothing... Um, that's totally unique about the concept of, of baptism in the Catholic faith. When you look at how beautiful it is for baby business, yeah. you know, the children can actually look at one and the other and think, Oh my goodness, mm. you know, what, what's the same and what's different and what's, what's the meaning. And, um, I think it, it's a, a, you know, if we're looking at um, building an Aboriginal perspective into everything we do, mm. that's a, really important one for faith yeah I agree and um you know for me when I part of writing that story too was I have I teach a lot of Indigenous kids at my school and a lot of them don't know where they come from they don't no. know who their mob is and I wanted to for for that specifically to get for them to have a sense of being on country on Durham country because they live on Durham country and so um for me, that was very much in my mind as well. Like, um, you know, because you don't know where you belong. And I thought that that's so sad. You don't know where you belong, you know? And um, for these kids who don't often see any books about themselves, to have something like that, which shows mm -hmm. them connecting to country is really, it, it's really important. Mm -hmm. that, that invisibility you're talking about, um, that you're hitting at my, my my dad's first school was um, back in before I was born, so back in the late fifties, um, early sixties. His first school was uh, about I think fifty k's out of Moree. I've seen photos of his school, and they're all, they're all white kids. And in none of the stories that my dad tells about Moree do do Indigenous kids even rate a mention. And I I'm wondering where they all were. Any idea? Yeah, and the mission. 
Yes. yes, well, there's still a big mission school there not too far away from Maury, really, just outside of um, Gundawindi. Um, oh, gosh, I should know. Tumala, Tumala. And really, that's, there's, you know, that some things probably haven't made the progress that we'd like to think. And that whole story of Maury, what's that book um, from the, yes, vote yes, that's, I think that's what the title is. I can picture it with the so the indigenous girl and the the white girl, and that's the the, the full story of what happened there at Maury. Mm -hmm. Well, not always very. <laughs> um. So what's what's next for you guys? Have you got a, got anything in the anything in the plan? Yeah. Yeah, lots of things. <laughs> um. We just want to follow on and um, share some more stories, probably a bit similar to Kui, but um, the idea was to touch on um, traditional times and then we want to like move forward and come into the times now. So we're not really sure exactly how that's going to look, but we're definitely going to be working on quite a few more books. Leanne has one coming out this year as well. Thank you. Don't talk about that. <laughs> um, it's called Share. Um, I'm doing the illustrations for um, Fran Muir. That Jasmine's done the Your Respect, aren't you? And no, no, our family. I did family. Yeah. Family and then Share. Yeah. And is that through Mugabala as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. i got to say, and this is not sponsored by Mugabala, but I have to say, <laughs> my God, the stuff that they're producing is just, just ordinary. Beautiful. And, um, you know, amazing creators. And Donna, who is going to be here as a designer from, um, from Mugabala, and she's very proud of the books that they're turning out as well. So well done to them. Mm, I agree. Mm -hmm. Donna's really amazing. Yeah, I think um, it's been hard to, because we never had any expectation that Kui would do well. We thought it might do well in Sydney, <laughs> so, um, but we didn't really know uh, how it would be received or, you know, even the other, or even baby business. So I feel I have, I've been feeling a little bit of pressure about what to do next. I'm not really sure. <laughs> so I just want to um, think about it a bit. I have, you know, you have loads of ideas and I think um, it's really hard to get an idea to the end. And for me, Kui Mitigo and even Baby Business was done out of sheer desperation because there was nothing. Mm. It was a real desire to have something. Um, so that was really what drove that to, you know, that sort of real core, it really has to happen. Well, no. judging by the, that up. I mean, Leanne, when you mentioned earlier about, you know, your your mum and your your grandmother and 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 um, how proud they they are and would be of, of this book, I I did I did reflect on what you said as, as you're saying. I remembered when um, when you guys won the award, there was a lot of emotion there. So let's give me a little bit more clarity as to, <laughs> as to what that was about. And um, there are other people on the on the other people on the uh, platform or on the stage that day who weren't quite as um, <laughs> gracious as you were. So <laughs> we were terrible. <laughs> we couldn't stop crying far up. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so the book is, uh, well, we're not just talking about the book, but the book that we've been talking about, of course, is Kui Mitigar by uh, Jasmine Seymour and Lee and Margot Watson. There's Baby Business by Jasmine Seymour. All the Magabala books um, and all the books that, uh, look, I, you know, I, I kind of think back to the books that I was reading when I was a, a kid, because I, I grew up in Fiji and the, the books I was reading were all these sort of classic puffin books. And we're talking about Patricia Wrightson and we're talking about Ivan Southall and these guys and, and their depiction of Indigenous kids, it, it wasn't attempting to be disparaging but it kind of just was mm. um and so I, I feel really you know because eustace from the rocks of honey who was he had his skills but at the same time he was still called useless and it was it was always this sort of 
mm. with one hand and take away with the other. And I know that was a product of the times and, and all of those things, but I, I have to say that I am, I'm really glad to be part of an industry that is doing what it can to try and claw back some kind of respectability for First Nations people uh, from, a, from a literate perspective. Because, I mean, sorry, there's a little bit of a, a <laughs> sermon, I guess, but I'm really proud of being a children's writer because I think that what children, you know, oftentimes you, you're tempted, I think, to go, oh, this generation's lost. I mean, look at what's happening in Canberra right now. And you go, you know what, maybe those guys can all just get in the bin and we'll get some year six kids to sort this out because they seem to be a little bit more sort of switched on at the moment. So um, I think part of our job as people who write for children or who put the right books in front of children or teach, and I know, I know Grace is a teacher, I know Patricia's a teacher, um, we, what we're, all we're trying to do is trying to give these kids the best tools to understand and live in a better world. So I, I just, I'm really grateful to everyone involved, um, illustrators and writers and everybody. So thank you for, um, for what you do as well. Yeah, have- I, look, I agree with that. Uh, you know, for me, when I was doing baby business, I wanted to see Indigenous people that look like normal families because so often we don't get to see that just being completely normal, like a Bob Graham family or an Alison Lester family, just mm. having beautiful faces and looking beautiful. That's yeah. what I want to see. Yeah, you know? In her own sort of way, Leah Purcell was trying to do that with um, Redfern now, but it still ended up being a bit of a ghetto story, didn't it? Rather than, a, you, know, mm. you know, people living living in modern Australia. Yeah. Um, yeah. Me to be critical of, but that was just my observation. Um, yeah, yeah. Did anyone have any comments or questions before we wrap it up? Because I've got a fairly, fairly ordinary chicken um, parmesan waiting for me in the morning. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm still down at the office and I've got a two hour drive home, so I'm going to wolf down some something out of a box. Yeah. So, Patricia, when you turned up, and I thought you might have been the same lady who had the. Um, yes. Hurry given up. me an idea though because all of the all of that um work you know with the, oh gosh newton or john newton i think and his work looking at oh, recipes and research into and combining indigenous foods and i've got a great interest in it but not a lot of skills growing a, a few indigenous things in the, in my little veggie patch but what, what next <laughs> what thing are you growing Morigal greens and they're they're the best, really. They just they're rampant, and you can eat them just like a spinach. Mm. So flash, you know, flash fry or steam, stir fry. It's just unfortunate. beautiful. It's unfortunately, that bears such a striking resemblance to oleander, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe not. Oh dear. All right, guys. Well, uh, coming along. We do thank this, you. We do this on the first. Um, the first Monday of, of each month. Um, you're all, of course, welcome to return uh, next time. I'm not sure who our guest is going to be next time. Um, but uh, please, uh, are you, Patricia, are you in a kind of, when you found out about the, tonight, is that something that you'll find out about in the future as well? Are you across what we're doing? And I think so. I get your Westwards emails. I work closely with um, someone from the office who has had um, an art, an artist and writer in residence, and I think that's all been organised through Westwards. Is that right? So, yeah. So that's, and when I saw tonight, it was coming to go. I thought, right, I'm interested in that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's been enlightening and it has. It's been really good. <laughs> all right, thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks.